Our Bible reading this morning is from Matthew chapter 21, the first 17 verses, the story of Jesus' entry into Jerusalem as the rightful king of the Jews and as the Lord of the temple. Now when they drew near to Jerusalem and came to Bethphage to the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village in front of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, you shall say, The Lord needs them, and he will send them at once. This took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet, saying, Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal, of a beast of burden. The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and put on them their cloaks, and he sat on them. Most of the crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. And the crowds that went before him and that followed him were shouting, Hosanna to the Son of David! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord! Hosanna in the highest! And when he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred up, saying, Who is this? And the crowds said, This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth of Galilee. And Jesus entered the temple and drove out all who sold and bought in the temple. And he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold pigeons. He said to them, It is written, My house shall be called a house of prayer. But you make it a den of robbers. And the blind and the lame came to him in the temple, and he healed them. But when the chief priests and the scribes saw the wonderful things that he did, and the children crying out in the temple, Hosanna to the Son of David, they were indignant. And they said to him, Do you hear what these children are saying? And Jesus said to them, Yes. Have you never read out of the mouths of infants and nursing babies? You have prepared praise. And leaving them, he went out of the city to Bethany and lodged there. This ends the reading of God's word, and God always blesses his word to those who listen. Back when Maria was six years old, and our family was quite a bit smaller than it is now, we were in a town and we went to its magnificent church during the middle of the week just because it was a fantastic building, a beautiful place, and we hadn't been there. So we went to that church and it was impressive. It had a huge, high, splendid, glorious ceilings and, and wonderful stained glass windows that showed various scenes from the life of the Lord Jesus Christ. And out in the lobby, there were a few people that were selling trinkets and souvenirs and various things like that, and they were jabbering some. But other than that, it was pretty quiet in that church. And as we were looking at those various things, Maria saw that window with a picture of Jesus dying on the cross, and she started to sing, My Jesus, I love thee. I know thou art mine. And as she started singing that song, one of the people from the lobby suddenly walked in and said, you have to be quiet, this is a church. (laughs) And then went back to selling her trinkets. I had a hard time um, not thinking of that event when I read about the Pharisees and the chief priests trying to shush up those children. This is a temple. We need to be more dignified. The children are too noisy. That's one problem. And the other problem is, and this was their real problem, you don't deserve that kind of praise. They're saying, Hosanna to the son of David. They're yelling that because Son of David is the title for Messiah. And that's not you. So they are outraged, these religious leaders, for a couple of reasons. The children are a little too noisy in the temple. 
when they could be doing business and selling stuff, and Jesus has just messed that up, and they also do not want Jesus to be praised as the Messiah. And still, we need to, we need to reflect on the children's praises and sometimes why there is opposition to children praising. Sometimes it comes because people don't want Jesus to be the one who is praised, and other times it comes because they don't want children, little children, kind of messy, noisy, uh, children who don't always understand that much to be the ones doing the praising. But children who praise are on to something. And one of the first things we need to realize is that children can know something deep in themselves from a very early age, who God is, who Jesus is, and they can praise Him. Jesus, after His disciples returned from a mission, was filled with joy through the Holy Spirit and said, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and learned and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for this was your good pleasure. While the religious experts, the important people, are running their business and trying to shush the children, God is revealing things to the little children and hiding those same marvelous things from the wise and the learned and the big shots. So it was on Palm Sunday when the little children were praising and the chief priests were shushing and griping and selling because even after they stop believing, the selling goes on and on. The institution will always continue. Colleges and seminaries that lose their sense of mission, that no longer believe the Bible, will still have their endowment and they will still keep on rolling. Churches that have long lost their salt and their savor will still have their budgets and sometimes their robes and candles even. But the reality will be gone. Those leaders are not leading people to Jesus anymore. And yet where the wise, the learned, the professors with their lofty theories that deny Christ, that deny the Creator, while they go and miss what's happening the little children are still singing to Jesus. And so it shall ever be. Those who are too smart for their own good, or at least think they are, will always miss out. The Bible says that God will destroy the wisdom of the wise. The intelligence of the intelligent He will frustrate. Where is the wise man? Where is the scholar? Where is the philosopher of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? God does not try to impress us with His wisdom. The people who are always looking for wisdom are going to miss out on the wisdom of God because God is so smart they never get the hang of it anyway. If they would just learn to shut their mouths themselves and wonder and marvel and praise, then there might be some hope. But it is to little children that God reveals some of the most important things. Children who praise Jesus in simple faith surpass the preachers and professors who deny Jesus. And Jesus goes on to say, not only have things been revealed to them so that they can praise God, but then Jesus goes on to quote from Psalm 8. They say, don't you hear what these children are saying about you? It's blasphemy. They think it's blasphemy that he's just being called the Messiah, the King of Israel, the Deliverer. Actually, Jesus is more than that. He quotes from Psalm 8, Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. Jesus quotes only this part, From the lips of children and infants you have ordained praise. That's the part he quotes. But remember, these are scholars he's quoting to. So they know the sentence that comes right before it, that he's actually not just the son of David, he's the Lord whose excellent name is to be praised throughout all the earth, whose glory is above the heavens. Oh, and there's one more little tidbit. Not just the sentence before the lips of children and infants, but what comes next? Because of your enemies to silence the foe and the avenger. So, 
When Jesus says, well, haven't you read that out of the mouths of children and nursing babies you have ordained praise? Yeah, they'd read that. They knew the Bible like the back of their hand. And they knew that quote. And they knew that those praises were to be directed to the God with the excellent name. And that's who Jesus is saying he is. I am the Lord with the majestic name whose glory is above the heavens. And he's also saying, you are the enemy. These babies are crying out because you don't. These babies are crying out because if they didn't, the rocks would. You are the enemy. And God has ordained the little ones to quiet down and to shush the enemy. What if it's time for the unbelieving preachers to be quiet so that the children and babies can be heard? I remember um, being in a church, too, and this was a, with a godly preacher, but I still remember uh, one of our kids, one of the babies, was letting out a howl, and he just stopped everything and kind of stared until the baby could make an exit. You know, we, we don't want those disruptive little noisemakers. There's important things for important people to teach and important people to hear. But there may be more important things that are going on that aren't always according to our plans. One of the difficulties, of course, of Jesus' enemies on that occasion, the chief priests, was they didn't believe he was the son of David. They certainly didn't believe that he was the God of the excellent name whose glory is above the heavens. They had many arguments with him about that, and they would not. They refused to believe it. But they weren't the only ones who had a problem with babies and Jesus. It was the most severe problem because they wouldn't believe in Jesus. But even Jesus' friends who did believe in Jesus had sort of a problem with babies and Jesus. Now they were bringing even infants to Jesus that he might touch them. And when the disciples saw it, they rebuked them. But Jesus called them to him saying, Let the children come to me and do not hinder them. For to such belongs the kingdom of God. Truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. And he took the children in his arms, put his hands on them, and blessed them. The disciples thought Jesus was too important for those babies. They thought they were too important for those babies. And Jesus, says another scripture, was indignant. He was mad at those disciples. And he said, you cut it out. Now let those babies come to me because the kingdom of God belongs to them and you better become like them if you even want to get in. Now is that our mentality? Very often we think that maybe someday the little kids will reach an age where they could actually become right with God and enter his kingdom. What if we need to do a little bit of reflecting and say, wow, I... I need to stop thinking they need to move on up to my level and think uh, maybe I need to get back down to their level where I simply trust and praise and love. There was a good book, a very fine book with a very good title, Your God is Too Small, and that can be a problem. When you think that God is just this little nothing and you don't see how great and majestic he is and how he rules the universe and how splendid and powerful he is, that's a problem. And so sometimes we need to read the book, Your God is Too Small. But sometimes your God is too big. The Pharisees and the chief priests could not believe in a God who could come as a baby in a manger and grow up just as a man in Nazareth. God is too big for that. And God thought the disciples is too big to bother with babies. Let them grow up a little, and then maybe they can spend some time with the Savior and become disciples. No, they, they're in the kingdom already. They can become disciples right now, says Jesus. So be very careful not to let your God be too big. I remember... Growing up in the church and in a Christian family with an excellent Christian school and many good things. One thing that I don't think was so good was that almost nobody, when I was growing up, made profession of faith before they were adults, 18, 19, 20. Um, if you, nobody made profession of faith before that. They just didn't. I made profession of faith when I was 14 and I was the youngest kid in my church who ever did it. And I should have done it when I was nine. 
because when I was nine, I already knew the Lord as my Savior. I had a pretty clear grasp of the basic truths of the faith, but you, you wait and you wait and you wait and you wait. And finally, when I was 14, I didn't wait any longer. But, but that was just kind of the custom because it was kind of a rite of passage of adulthood. And you didn't take the Lord's Supper before then either. Well, now, um, you know, sometimes that was still a custom that carried on in quite a few churches. And it was hard to shake the notion that, that kids younger than that could actually profess their faith and have a real faith and a lasting faith. When, I'll go back to Maria when she was little. When Maria was eight, same age as Bethany is now, um, she wanted to make a profession of faith. And so I mentioned that to the pastor of our congregation, and he agreed to come with an elder and to interview them. And they came over to our house and interviewed Maria, and it was a very nice interview. They asked questions very gently, and Maria answered very well, and, and then they left. And they recommended her for make, to the council for making profession of faith. And she did in front of the church. And later on, that elder who had come over um, talked to us a little bit about that. And he said, when I came over to your house, I was pretty grumpy and pretty skeptical. Because I thought, what in the world is an eight-year-old doing making profession of faith? And he said, later that night, I went home, and I had tears in my eyes, and I told my wife, I need to repent. And maybe I need to be more like that little girl. Now, Maria knows, you know, a lot happens between the time you're eight and in your mid to late 20s. A lot of questions arise. A lot of challenges come your way. There are days when you just wish you could be eight again and have that simple faith free of all the questions, free of all the rough roads that you travel through life. You can't go back. And we shouldn't spend too much time wishing we could go back and become eight or five again because we are meant to mature, we're meant to grow in grace, we're meant to get toughened by some of those challenges, to think through some of the hard questions, and to just develop our grasp on truth and its grasp on us. But never lose that love, that wonder, that faith of a child. Some of us, uh, myself included, need to go back at times and say, okay, I, I've read the stacks of books, I've been through this and that, but at heart, I'm just that little kid that God claimed. I'm still that nine-year-old that my mom said, hey, the Bible says, uh, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with him and eat with me. I'm 53, but I'm not a whole lot older than nine yet, not, not where I really live. And... If we ever get beyond thinking we need that heart of a child that just welcomes Jesus gladly and praises him with our whole heart, we're getting a little too big for our britches, and we need to get little again. We need to get little in our own hearts, and we certainly, as we welcome the children God gives us, need to regard them right now, not someday when they reach an age of discretion or age of this or that, but right now, view them as members of God's kingdom and treat them as followers of Jesus and of his dear disciples. Let him bless them right now. Let him welcome them right now. When you have little ones of your own, just the way you welcome them onto your lap, the way you read them God's word, let that be the voice of Jesus. Let that be the embrace of Jesus as he welcomes the little ones. And let me just remind you again of some strange things that may hit your ears rather odd, but I believe that it sometimes happens that people are born again spiritually even before they're born physically. You say, oh man, that sounds like heresy to me. <laughs> well, you might want to have a little conversation with Zechariah, the father of John the Baptist, and with Elizabeth, his mother. Zechariah was told he will be filled with the Holy Spirit when? From his mother's womb. And it was while he was still in his mother's womb that little baby John the Baptist leaped for joy at the sound of the voice of Mary, the mother of Jesus. Because before John the Baptist became the mighty preacher, before he had the intellectual grasp on the truths that he had to teach, the Holy Spirit was already working in him and giving him life. 
And we shouldn't take just one example and broaden it and say, now I've got a whole theology that everybody's born again before they're born. But we should consider the possibility that God, who said the kingdom of heaven belongs to these little babies, might be at work in the little babies. Do you think Natalie is going to realize that she is loved only when she has learned the word mommy or daddy? Long before you can put things into words, you know them because they simply are realities that surround you. And you only later put words to those realities that have already surrounded you. And very often it is that way with God's embrace of the little children. There are people who, because of the way they grow up or are taught, feel kind of like there's something wrong with them if they can't give quite a dramatic testimony of, I was lost in the byways and then suddenly I was saved and now I know that though I was lost, God has brought me back. And that's a wonderful thing when God does that. When God saves us from the empty way of life handed down to us from our fathers, um, there are people sitting right here who can testify that I was not brought up a believer, but God saved me in a wonderful way. But that isn't everybody's testimony. I remember um, hearing and then, and on tape and then reading a book by uh, someone who was speaker on the Back to God Hour before I was, uh, Dr. Peter Eldersveld. He was... He died when I was only four, so I don't, ha I don't remember him, you know, from having heard him live on the radio. I just read some of his stuff later. And Dr. Eldersveld was used by the Lord to lead many people to him, people who had lived wicked lives, who hadn't known the Lord, who were born again, who came to faith. And he said, I love to hear those testimonies of how they're saved. And he says, some of my colleagues in ministry, too, they give these dramatic testimonies, and it's wonderful. And he says, I don't have a testimony like that. But I think I have a good testimony, too. And here's his testimony. I've never known a day in my life when I could not believe I was a child of God. Now, don't misunderstand. That doesn't mean I haven't been a great sinner. But no matter how great the sins, there's never been a night in my life when I couldn't lay down my head and believe that God forgave my sins. My parents brought me up that way from the very earliest moments of my life. They brought me up to believe a promise, a covenant promise. They promised me that their God would be my God, even if it cost him the blood of his son. And that promise has been fulfilled. There are different testimonies and different ways by which God brings people to God. Sometimes it happens later in life and in dramatic ways. Sometimes it happens in rather subtle and gradual ways where you kind of investigate and think about it, and all of a sudden you find yourself believing and becoming a different person. For others, they just cannot remember a day when they didn't belong to Jesus. And that's a pretty good testimony, too, because God has welcomed people, even from their very infancy, into his family. Well, the Bible never tells the kids that they have to become like adults in order to enter the kingdom, although it does tell us to grow up in our faith and to grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But it does repeatedly urge the grown-ups not to lose what is childlike, and in fact, that they may need to become like a child again. And some of the ways is, is simply craving nourishment. Like newborn infants, long for the pure spiritual milk, so that by it you may grow up into salvation if indeed you've tasted that the Lord is good. You don't have to be some big shot. If you're just a little baby with a sucking instinct and you want milk, hey, if that's all the more maturity you have, great, because never lose that appetite for God's Word. Once you've tasted that the Lord is good, just want more and more and more to feed on God. If you want to be great, well, Jesus has something to say about that too. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus saying, Who's the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And calling to him a child, he put him in the midst of them and said, Truly I say to you, unless you turn, or the word for turn is also translated repent, unless you turn and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. So we can be like children in our craving for God's word, be like children in our humility. Children 
can't do that much for themselves when they're wee little. They need a lot done for them, but they just trust and depend. And no matter how big you get, you cannot get beyond trusting and depending. The whole gospel is this, that Jesus has done everything necessary to set you right with God, and you're saved by trusting Him and depending on Him, and not by what you do, but by what He does as you trust and depend. And there's one of my favorite psalms, Psalm 131. My heart is not proud, O Lord. My eyes are not haughty. I do not concern myself with great matters or things too wonderful for me. But I've stilled and quieted my soul. Like a weaned child with its mother, like a weaned child is my soul within me. O Israel, put your hope in the Lord, both now and forevermore. And as we rest in the Lord, that doesn't mean we don't grow up. That doesn't mean we don't become strong, but we, we turn again and again. No matter how big you get, you're still God's child. You know, it's, um, you know, my parents are over again for the week, and, you know, I do a few things for them now, you know, pick them up from the airport and what have you. But no matter how old you get, I don't start calling them by their first names. Uh, you know, they're always my parents. And no matter how old you get, you're never on equal terms with God. There are things too wonderful for you, too lofty for you even to bother trying to figure out. Many of us have mysteries of the faith that we've tried to figure out and we just got a headache from it. Well, there is a time to just quiet your soul and say, Lord, you know I don't. The hidden things belong to the Lord our God. The things revealed belong to us and to our children forever. But I'm just going to be quiet now, be still, and know that he's God quiet my soul like a child, and rest in him. But then not always quiet, of course, because what is the title of the sermon? Children's praise. So as God reveals himself to you and shows himself even to little children, and as God brings you to himself humbly to rest in him, then he opens your mouth to praise him, to sing to him, to rejoice in him, and to not hold back. What a privilege it is to be a child of God and to have the opportunity to praise and to sing to him. I will just, um, having said that some people can grow up knowing the Lord, I can also say there is a hazard of growing up religious because you can grow up in a certain setting and go through certain activities and think that that's what makes a Christian. And Jesus spoke with somebody like that. He spoke with Nicodemus and he said, I tell you the truth, no one can see the kingdom of God unless he is born again. How can a man be born when he's old? Nicodemus asked. Surely he cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb to be born. When you hear a sermon about children's praise and children this and children that, you say, well, that's a little late in the game. I'm not a kid anymore. Well, you can't enter into your mother's womb again, but you can be born again. And it's never too late for that. I've mentioned the little ones that God can start at the earliest age. I remember one guy who... I heard was listening to the radio program that I used to do, and he said he was saved, and he was 91 years old. 91! And he was born again. So nobody is too old for God to make them like a little child and to bring them to faith and to praise him again. So I don't care what age you are. Uh, today, it's time to all be children, to all praise our God, to trust in him, and remember the one the children were praising. He's riding on this donkey, knowing what's coming. He knows he's the rightful king. He's entering the temple. He gives it its proper use. He teaches the people in the temple the truth of God. He heals the sick. He welcomes the children and hears their praises. That's what the temple is for. It's for Jesus to teach. It's for the hurting to be helped and healed. It is for praise to ring, especially from the children. And he knew what that would do to the enemies. He knew they would arrest him. He knew he would be tortured terribly. He knew he would be killed. He knew he would bear all the sins of the world on that cross. And he did that so that we might become children of his Father that we might have all the barriers between us and him removed, and so we could just be little children resting in his arms again.
praising him forever. Lord, you do deserve our praise. You're great beyond our imagination, and sometimes we just have to still and quiet our souls before you. And yet somehow you also became so small in that manger, and so weak on that cross, that we might be made right with the eternal and almighty God. We praise you that your foolishness is wiser than man's wisdom, that your weakness is stronger than man's strength. And we pray that you will give each of us the heart of a little child to trust, to love, to praise, to rejoice, and to be yours forever. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. All glory, laud, and honor to thee, Redeemer King. A great Palm Sunday hymn. Let's stand together and sing it.